Hey, my friends, Jason Amendis here. So glad to be with you guys. Now, I'm going to do something a little different today here on Stand Strong Ministries is I've asked, given the fact that we have a huge election coming, if you're paying attention this November 3rd, 2020. And so I've asked two dear friends and colleagues of mine to jump on and do a pre-recorded show talking about Christians in voting this election. As you know, there's a lot of controversy out there. On both sides, people are making the case why they can vote for Trump over Biden. And then the other side of many progressive Christians are saying, no, Biden's a better choice because he'll bring better uh, policies than Trump has done the last four years. And then there's, of course, a lot of Christians who are undecided. They're very confused. They don't know what they should do. Should they vote for Trump? If they vote for Trump, are they supporting the lifestyles that he had lived in the previous time before becoming president? Or should they vote for Biden? Because even though Biden's not you know, for pro-life policies, he's, a, he's for abortion, is there other policies, though, that can override that? So what I thought we should do in the midst of all the noise and chaos, and of course, if you have noticed lately, there have been some very prominent, well-respected, well-regarded Christian leaders who have put out blogs and have done interviews talking about either sitting this election out or telling people why they can't vote for either one of the candidates. And particularly, a lot of uh, people that we respect that Michael, Scott, and myself are very, very good friends with, they have taken the issue uh, even with, with Trump and his policy and his administration. And so we want to talk about these things. And we do believe that faith and politics are inseparable. And we believe also that God has called us to be salt and light in the world. And when it comes to these type of issues today, we have to, as Christians, we have to respond to them. Now, before I invite my two guests on, I want to bring you um, up to speed on several books that Dr. Michael Brown has written these are, are two of the previous uh, or the latest books, I should say, that he's put out. The one here, When the World Stops, Words of Hope, Faith, and Wisdom in the Midst of Crisis, is his latest book, an excellent read. And one that I really found fascinating was Jezebel's War with America. So you can go to askdrbrown.org to check out those books and many other things that he has put on. Also, Scott has done, an, in recent weeks, a great interview, a sit-down panelist, uh, conservative Christians who were talking about the abortion issue with our good friend John Stone Street at the Colson Center. And my faith votes put this thing on. And as always, Scott did a, an amazing job. So you can go to YouTube, check out my faith votes. And the, the title for that panelist discussion was How Then Shall We Vote? Life and Death on the Ballot. I watched that and it was so informative and such a blessing to have those people put that together. So if you've not seen it yet, please go to YouTube, check out that video and send it to your friends, post it on social media. And also real quickly, you can go to challengingconversations.org. My latest book just came out this week with Baker Books. And we deal with a lot of these topics, racism, abortion, a lot of key controversial issues that a lot of Christians are being silent about. And this book will help you jump into the conversation. So with that being said, let me invite my two dear friends and colleagues, Scott Klusendorf and Dr. Michael Brown. Welcome the two of you. Scott, good to see you. Michael, good to see you. Good to Great see you, to Jason. See you. Now, obviously, as I was saying in the opening, there is a lot of confusion going on. And when you look back in 2016, just four years ago, there were so many evangelical leaders who were standing strong for Trump. But then, and then four years later, all of a sudden, it's like a lot of people are backing out. And so obviously, we're going to be touching base with four key topics to really help the viewer, you know, jump in there if they've not voted already. Obviously, we have had record attendance right now. I've already, you know, voted early. I'm sure you guys probably did as well. So there's a lot of people who've already voted, over 60 plus million, but we know there's there's probably still over 100 plus million people who are going to vote on November 3rd. But Michael, why is there so much confusion over these two candidates in 2020? Well, first thing is, I've actually seen the reverse trend. I've seen many people who didn't vote for Trump in 2016 now voting for him in 2020. Uh, the reason being that we all knew he was a certain type of character. We all knew that he could be destructive with his words. We all knew that he could be cruel and petty and juvenile and immature. Uh, we knew these things about him based on the way he ran in, in the primaries and the way he attacked some of the Republican candidates. So we had fears and concerns that he would act like that, but we had hope that he would keep his promises to evangelicals and, and do the things that we thought were important. And he's been off the charts with that. He's done that in a way that no president in our lifetime has. So we have this quandary where 
On the one hand, he's done more for evangelical causes than any president that we've had. And, you know, be it pro-life, be it religious liberty, be it standing with Israel, be it so many issues that are important to us, he surrounded himself with evangelicals. To this moment, he has not pushed them away. That's amazing. On the other hand, he's done more to hurt the evangelical cause than any president in our lifetimes, because to the extent we're associated with him and identify with him, when he calls this one a dog and savages this one and attacks this one and throws this one under the bus and lies and exaggerates, we get associated with that. So that's the great challenge that we're facing right now. Will we see more good come to the nation by voting for Donald Trump? But in the process, will that hurt our gospel witness? That's the great challenge that we have to weigh through and understand and then make a, a good, educated decision. Yeah, well said. Scott, what are your thoughts, too, based on what Michael said about what you're seeing then? Are you seeing a lot of Christians actually coming out more now, even though there's some very prominent Christian leaders? And we'll get to that in a second. Are you seeing more Christians excited about maybe the Republican ticket, maybe the conservative values that they're being pushed in, in you know, on the campaign trail for the Republicans right now? I agree with Dr. Brown, at least among the people I am associated with, there's definitely an uptick in the people that are voting for Trump this time that sat it out in 2016. Um, I'll admit it, in 2016, I voted for Trump with a clothespin over my nose. Uh, I'm not viewing it this way uh, this time around. I'm actually looking forward to voting for him a little later today when I go to early vote. And the reason is this, while we certainly should not brush under the rug uh, Trump's moral failings, uh, which are many, we need to make a careful distinction here between sins which damn an individual and sins which injure and ultimately damn a nation. Uh, envy, for example, and looting are equally damnable before God. But there is no doubt that looting injures a nation far worse than envy does. And this is what's at stake in the present election. And a failure to distinguish those two types of sins, I think has confused a lot of people. And as a result, they don't know how to vote. So that's the problem we face uh, right now. All right, Scott, well, Mike and I'll just stop. We'll just let you take the call. If you, I mean, oh, no, you're I, so I important. Cut that baby off. I can't believe I didn't unplug that. Thing. <laughs> you want me to go back and re-record that? So no, you know no, no, no. We're good, man. <laughs> this, we're we're good. No, but I I think what you guys said is dead on, and I think we know that the culture, especially a lot of the media out there, they're trying to discourage people from voting. Michael, why do you think that is? Why they're trying to make it sound like Trump has no chance, and that Christians are too divided, and they're not going to come out and support the, our president? You know, when I see the liberal media. Uh, saying to the Republicans, if you want to win, you have to do X, Y, Z. You know that they're not giving advice because they want to see Republicans win. It, in, in other words, the strategies, the encouragement from those that differ with us are never meant to help us in our cause, but rather to hinder us in our cause. Uh, one pollster uh, recently said that uh, he doesn't believe a lot of the polls that are out there. He believes that some of these pollsters should be uh, disqualified on a certain level because they've been so far off. They were so far off in 2016. And he said that, that a lot of it is meant to discourage people from coming out and voting, that you think it's a lost cause. There's no reason to even try. If I'm told, hey, your state is hanging in the balance, man, I'm going to get out and vote. If I'm told my candidate's down by 15 points the day of the election, why bother? So there's a lot more going on. There's a lot more at stake. There's a lot more bias, and I see it from every side. Frankly, I see blindness, bias on every side. On the one hand, you have the so-called cult of Trump. On the other hand, you have what's called Trump derangement syndrome. And it scares me when I see people that I know and have known for years start to become irrational when it comes to the election. So I think the biggest thing that we have to do, just like when we do apologetics, is we have to adequately understand the other side and feel the weight of the objection before we can respond to it. Then rather than talking past each other, we might be able to raise some arguments that are helpful. So uh, someone told me yesterday on Facebook that they had a couple of their friends read John Piper's article about sitting out the elections and decided to do that until they read my response to Piper and said they're, they're going to vote and they know who they're voting for, in this case, Donald Trump. So if we can understand what the person's saying, 
then respond to it, perhaps we can change some minds. Mm. Okay, so I appreciate that as an opening. Hopefully, it just kind of we're kind of establishing, you know, kind of where the three of us are coming from and and looking at some of the, you know, illogical arguments, Michael, as you guys said, but also seeing the massive rallies that are taking place for Trump around the country. Uh, and again, having a lot of the black vote, a lot of people who are coming out in support, uh, you know, the platinum deal that he just was rolling out for black communities to start helping him reduce crime, you know, get them better jobs, get them training, you know, giving some school vouchers, some opportunity for these kids who are not being educated, who are roaming the streets to get into the streets and having a lot of programs that are providing care for them because you have a lot of broken single homes. So, I mean, you're seeing an uptick, I think, too, and, and it's pretty exciting actually to see despite, again, when you turn on the news, which I think is becoming obsolete these days, you know, um, you know, people are listening to you guys, they're listening to me, they're listening to so many other people on YouTube and other platforms. You know, your radio show, Michael, has reached a lot of people. And Scott, you have, you know, being one of the leading pro-life apologists in the world, you have spoken in, in pretty much every arena and debated some of the top, you know, plant parenthood you know, models of, of, you know, regarding their positions on abortion. And so you guys have seen that there are minds that are being changed because of common sense. So one of the things I want to jump in uh, and that you hear a lot, and again, a lot of the articles that I've read or a lot of the reasons why people are not voting or they attack the other person, again, Christian on Christian sometimes, which is very unfortunate and very sad. You know, the Bible says in Romans 14, 1, that, you know, we're not to quarrel, right, over little things or contrary things. Now, this is a big issue, so we want to have an open debate, but we do it respectfully. We speak the truth in love, making sure that, you know, that they're not our opponents where we're going to, you know, um, you know, be critical towards them. We can critique their positions, you know, see if it's illogical, uh, why we don't believe that their argumentation is sound enough, maybe biblically, theologically, on even on policy. Uh, but when we do that, we just want to make people uh, understand that we're not being critical of Christians in general or for anyone for that matter, but we are coming together because I think we need to be addressing things so much more. So one of the first areas that I want to touch base on and see what you guys think is how do you respond when someone makes the case for the lesser of two evils as to why they're going to vote, let's say for Trump over Biden, is that a strong enough, a strong enough argument? And Scott, I'll start with you. No, it's not. And I think it goes against biblical principles. If you look at scripture, God holds sovereigns responsible for upholding the weak and vulnerable and limiting evil and promoting the good. Who is the sovereign in a constitutional republic like ours? We are, the people. And that means we have a duty to vote in such a way that we promote the good and limit the evil insofar as possible given current political realities. I actually reject the idea that we're voting for the lesser of two evils. In fact, I think my good friend Kevin Bywater at the Oxford uh, Study Center puts it real well. We're not voting for the lesser of two evils in this election. We're voting to lessen evil. One party and one candidate are going to promote evil wholesale. If you don't believe that, you have not read the Democratic platform. You've not listened to their speeches. They're not hiding this stuff. Joe Biden has said in his first 100 days, he will pass the Equality Act, which will be devastating for religious liberty. It will be devastating for pro-life legislation. It's a massive evil thing. And yet, what we have going on are Christians who are saying, well, I can't uh, vote for the lesser of two evils. And then they all also say this regarding Trump's character evils. They say, well, Trump's character is evil. And they equate that with his policies. And that's a mistake. So to simply choose the lesser of two evils, we are voting to lessen evil. That's our job as Christians. Well said. What about you, uh, Michael? What, how would you respond to that argument? I'd first say that the whole political system itself is flawed and that everyone that runs for office is flawed, some more so than others, but that if we get so idealistic, then it'll completely paralyze us when it comes to politics. Mm -hmm. In other words, at, at best, we've got a flawed system with flawed human beings. And when you have, say, an article like John 
certain idealism for the characters for whom we're voting, you really can't vote for anyone. And when you find out what a lot of these people do behind the scenes, a lot of the presidents and officials, because if we knew all of that, we wouldn't have voted for anybody almost ever. If you go back to the, the, the first elections we had after George Washington and Jefferson versus Adams and things, it was, they were fierce. And the attacks were such that if Jefferson gets in, that's going to be the end of the union and things like that. So we've always had this, this pitched and intense battle. We've always had uh, a lot of political been the reality. And, and we, we, we have to be pragmatic more than idealistic at this time. But there's one other thing I think that we the ar The argument against Trump, and I say this as someone who voted for him with concern in 2016 and will vote for him with more confidence in 2020, that the argument is not just that Trump can be nasty and mean-spirited and insulting, but that he is a reckless human being. He will, he will incite uh, uh, all kinds of hostilities and division, that he deepens the divisions in the nation. There are now families divided over Donald Trump and churches divided over Donald Trump so that his very behavior is destructive. I think we need to grasp the weight of why people have a problem with Trump as, as Christians. But I can't vote for Trump for the following reasons. As he can be a jerk or he's stupid to say, he is loosing a certain atmosphere and attitude in the nation that's destructive. I look at that and I believe it's true in many ways, but then I look at what he's fighting against, the existential things he's fighting against, the life and death things he's fighting against, the things that will affect future generations, and it's a no-brainer that I would rather have a guy like that fighting against those things than have no say in which way the country goes. Mm. That's, that's good. So hopefully, again, the idea behind that was just addressing this argument, the lesser of two evils. And I think it does boil down to what you guys said is not just saying it's a lessening of evil has been the case. And I think, Michael, that's one of the things that I, again, philosophically sometimes even struggle through, even pastorally, is realizing, you know, when I look at First Timothy chapter 3 and I look at Titus chapter 1, I look at First Peter chapter 5 about a shepherd, about an elder, about a pastor. And we know the founding documents that were built on a Judeo-Christian ethic. Uh, there are certain qualifications to run for president, to be president, right? Uh, we're not hiring a pastor in that sense. You know, we're, we're hiring a, a, obviously a person that we want to make sure that is going to keep America safe um, and, and not take advantage of the power that they're given, right? And, this, and the checks and balances that we have, you know, and the thing that I remind, as you guys were just saying so eloquently, reminding a lot of our colleagues and friends out there and even people that are undecided is, you know, you can disapprove of a leader's qualifications, and even their character without condoning that person. You know, political figures are in the business of issuing policies that benefit society as a whole. And oftentimes when you look at legislation, it's not built on behaviors, but on ideals. And you have clearly, as you guys have, have pointed out, you have the Republican ticket where there are, there are ideals that will benefit people as a whole rather than uh, infringing upon their First Amendment rights. So I, I think that's important. So hopefully that will really encourage people because I have definitely seen people go after that particular argument. And, and I think that you guys did a good job articulating why it is actually a strong argument. As again, in, in a conversation, these are not just like little tabloid things or like bumper stickers. It takes time to, you know, build a case and have a conversation where you say, well, why do you believe that? Why do you believe in the lesser two evils? And let you know, that other person explain what they mean rather than just cut them off and think that's a, you know, that's a stupid argument. I hear a lot of people saying, which now brings us really to the big topic at hand when it comes to this election. And you guys are already kind of touching on it a little bit, but I do would like, I would like for us to jump into the particulars right now about moral flaws and failures that we actually see uh, with both candidates. Now, as you and I, you know, the three of us are, are talking about these things and the issues that we even have with Trump going into 2016. And then these recent articles, you know, that John Piper obviously put out on his Desiring God website. And we're all friends with John Piper. We all love him. He's a phenomenal pastor. God has used him incredibly for well over 40 plus years. I think one of the books that 
that he wrote that impacted my life when I was actually in Tucson, Arizona, studying philosophy. And one of the reasons I moved to Charlotte, North Carolina, I read his book, Don't Waste Your Life. And it really mm -hmm. challenged me. Um, and so when we have disagreements, and that's one thing I like to tell people as, you know, all of us as public figures, we have disagreements. We don't all ha carry the same theology uh, in some areas, but we hold to the essentials and we respect one another immensely. We are not the, we are not to be Christians who throw the baby out with the bathwater just because you oppose each other, maybe on soteriology or eschatology. And I know even just the three of us, we have differences of opinion on some things. Um, and so we definitely have a difference of opinion with our great friend, John Piper. But when he was referring to, obviously he didn't mention by name, but when he was referring to Trump, obviously, uh, and he was referring to uh, Joe Biden at times when he was dealing with terms like baby killing and sex switching and socialistic overreach, we know that he was talking about Biden, right? Sleepy Joe, as Trump likes to call him. Uh, but when he was talking about unrepentant sexual morality and unrepentant boastfulness, we know that he was actually referring to Trump. Um, and I'm not dis I'm not calling him out because he didn't mention my name. I mean, he was leaving that to the reader to understand where he was coming from. But I want to read a quote that he 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 issued, and I know you guys are familiar with it, and you guys had responded to it. Many people have. He said this in his blog thing. He says, "I think it is baffling and presumptuous to assume that pro-abortion policies kill more people than a culture saturating pro-self pride. When a leader models self." absorbed self-exalting boastfulness he models the most deadly behavior in the world he points his nation to destruction destruction of more kinds than we can imagine it is naive to think that a man can be effectively pro-life and manifest consistently the character traits that lead to death temporary and eternal uh or temporal and eternal so michael i know that you had come out and you responded to to your dear friend what what do you take that quote you know, that he, what, what was he trying to get across and, and whatever it was, is it a sound argument enough to not vote for Trump? In my mind, it's not a sound enough argument. And, and by the way, uh, John Piper and I have actually never met. So okay. it'd be great if he was my, he was my dear friend. So I don't want to paint a false picture, but of course I have great respect for him as, as we've said. So I appreciate the force of the argument. In other words, that when you go through the book of Proverbs, and you look, about a, look at what it says about a king or, and the destruction that a fool can bring and the destruction that a <clears throat> foolish king could bring, you realize that these are weighty things when you realize the power of the tongue. Uh, when you think, for example, uh, when uh, Trump is, is stirring up animosity, say, to Governor Whitmer, and she says whenever he says things against her after a, a plot to kidnap her, that the death threats increase, that, you know, these are weighty things. When you're the president, you carry a lot of weight. When you uh, treat those you differ with a certain way and tear them down, these things are certainly destructive and, and negative. But here's where I think John Piper has, has really missed the boat in a very, very severe way, that we distance ourselves from the comments, the rhetoric, the mindset of the president things and we as as leaders in the body or just believers can say we don't like that we don't agree with that we're not modeling that and and we can be effective with that however if we have someone who is legislating as as joe biden said overturns roe v wade he'll make it the law of the land or when he says, for example, transgender rights are the civil rights of the day, and you know what that's going to mean then for our religious freedoms if we differ with those things. Now we have policies that are in place that are affecting people. So if, if you have future generations looking back and, and they're asking, you know, grandma, grandpa, what were you doing when they took away our liberties? What, what, what were you doing when they enshrined these abortion laws just as it seemed that we were ready to turn the tide? What were you doing when millions more babies were getting slaughtered? What, what were you doing when we became weakened with our international enemies and it led to destruction of religious minorities in other countries? What were you doing? Well, we had the opportunity to vote, but the guy that was fighting all this was really nasty, mean-spirited, boastful, so we didn't vote for him. I don't think that'll fly. So that's why there are major differences here, and we have to really make that distinction. The other thing is that, that Trump, as many flaws as he has, uh, by being so unfiltered, 
uh, has changed in other ways. In other words, are, are there any charges of sexual morality in his case, say as there were with JFK or Bill Clinton in the White House? The answer is no. And does he still have godly people around him? Yes. And has he kept his word uh, at, at, at all costs? Yes. Well, that's a positive character uh, uh, aspect. So I think Pastor Piper, again, is too idealistic here and overdoes the criticism failing to realize the existential threat to our nation that Trump is pushing back against. That's well said. So, Scott, and you had put out something recently in response to where you gave a, a more or less a, a, a metaphorical, like a historical metaphor of something that occurred back in the 1860s and, and kind of giving the ultimatum like we face today. Would you like to share that, what, you, what argument that you laid out? Sure, and just to lead into it, I think Wayne Grudem made a really good point. He said, with President Trump, we're going to get a flawed candidate with good policies. With Joe Biden, we're going to get a flawed candidate with bad policies. So to equate the two, I think, is a mistake. The example I gave that you referenced a moment ago, Jason, was this. Imagine it's 1860. You're a Christian African slave chained deep in the bowels of a ship bound for Savannah, where if you survive the journey, you will be auctioned off to the highest bidder. You know the American election is coming up. What do you pray your brothers and sisters in Christ will do on election day? First, do you pray that they will vote for the candidate that is promised to promote slavery wholesale because he's good on other policies. And after all, slavery isn't the only issue. We shouldn't be a one issue voter. So do you pray for that? Or two, do you pray that your brothers and sisters in Christ will cast an effective vote to limit the evil of slavery, even though the candidate that holds that we should limit slavery has some nasty and brutish characteristics? Or number three, do you sit the election out completely because neither candidate uh, meets your standard of moral perfection? Which of those three options would you take if you were on that slave ship? And this is where I think uh, Dr. Piper, who I love and whose pro-life credentials are not in question here. This is a guy who's been arrested at Planned Parenthood protesting. This is a guy who's preached some great sermons on abortion. So those that have attacked uh, John Piper for not being pro-life enough have simply not done their homework. But I believe he is very badly mistaken to equate the moral wrongness of arrogance and unrepentant past sin with the intentional butchering of unborn human beings in the womb and say there's really no difference between the two. That to me is just wrong beyond measure. And I wish that uh, our fellow Christians, our brothers and sisters in Christ could see that we need to draw that distinction again between sins which damn an individual and sins which damn a nation. And Joe Biden, with his bad character and bad policy, is going to promote programs and laws which will, in fact, have a damning effect on our collective life together. Now, obviously, when it comes to Al Mohler, who we all respect too, he came out, obviously, in a very lengthy response, not just to Piper, but in general, of where he was at in, in 2016 to where he's at in 2020. He says, quote, he is sadly, referring to, to President Trump, deficient in many of the most crucial issues of character and moral virtue. He has bragged about many of his vices, written books promoting them, and giving full vent to some of the baser instincts of the body politic. He appears to be driven by a narcissistic impulse that overrides nearly every opportunity to demonstrate moral virtues in public. He has been married to three women and has bragged about infidelity. He is dis uh, divisive, arrogant, uh, vitriolic, and sometimes cruel. Okay, so obviously we know in the end he was pointing out a lot of the issues that we, obviously the three of us, would have, as well as many other Christians. But uh, in the end, though, based on what you guys are saying, he's going to vote for the president for a second term because he believes in, again, the lessening of evil. Uh, he's not condoning every immoral behavior that Trump has done in the past. But Michael, it seems that many people are assuming that the president is still 
engaging in like, let's say illicit sex. Um, and that, you know, voting for Biden is not a, a, a bad idea, but they said, I'm not going to vote for Trump because I don't want to condone his illicit, you know, practice of being with other women. But a vote for Biden uh, is condoning the advancement of policies that do fund abortions, the increase of LGBT rights. Again, we're referring to the Christian vote, right? And expanding anti-Christian and religious policies that would be detrimental to the First Amendment, whether you're Christian, Jehovah Witness, Mormons, Muslims, Catholics, right? Um, so based on what Mueller's saying, he's addressing a lot of the deep concerns. So how does one overcome those moral flaws that we do see in the president? And at the same time, should we be assuming that he's still that guy who is living like that in the White House? Right. So, so John Piper was mistaken to speak of unrepentant sexual immorality. We have no okay. evidence that he's unrepentant of that. And he does say that he regrets things from the past. People make a big deal out of the soundbite from years ago when, when he said that he's never asked for forgiveness. Uh, there's a story that a lot of people don't know, but it has been told in public that uh, James Robinson, a dear friend of mine and, and close to a number of past presidents and, and presidential candidates, does not endorse candidates, but he was very much opposed to, to Donald Trump. And when Ben Carson was going to endorse him, James was on the phone with him, urging him not to do it. And Ben made a deal with Trump and said, I will endorse you on the condition that you spend at least an hour alone with James Robinson. And James would text me and say, OK, I'm about to fly up to, to meet with Trump, et cetera. And it, it's actually an hour and a half they spent. At one point, he brought Eric in with him. Otherwise, just spoke to him alone. And James said to him, so uh, remember you said you never needed to ask for forgiveness. How about we draw up a little list together and Trump just smiled at him, uh, fully aware of these issues. When the horrific Hollywood access tape came out, Trump issued a statement saying that, that you know, he was, he was not proud of those things, said it in the debate with Hillary Clinton. And Melania said that's not the man she's married to. So that that's a false charge. He is not now and has not for years promoted, celebrated sexual immorality. And, and right now is setting an example as, as a married man in the White House. And you would think with all the attacks against him and the anonymous attacks, that if he was like JFK in the White House or allegedly LBJ or Clinton, that somebody would have said that. That so there have been no even accusations against that. As for his flaws, they are what they are. I would much rather that there was not so much collateral damage. But going back to, to the Piper argument that you cannot be truly pro-life and be like this, I, I believe you can. You have a man like Jehu in the Bible. And some have likened Trump to a Jehu type figure. And, and Jehu was zealous for the cause of the Lord and did a lot of good. And, and he was, was close with, with uh, uh, Jonadab of the Rechabites, who's kind of like a Mike Pence type figure, you know, godly reputation and all of this. And yet Jehu slaughtered a whole lot of people in the name of, of the Lord and in his zeal to wipe out idolatry. He slaughtered a lot of people. So he did good, but there was collateral damage. So right now we have to ask, and, and Scott's analogy was excellent. When it comes to the critical issues we're looking at, where to, what, what will be better for the nation? If you have to explain things to your kids and grandkids as to why you voted the way you voted, the consequences being what they are. And if, in fact, there is a world tendency to go in a direction that can be very destructive and push towards global government type things and, and one world orders that ultimately will hurt our cause and will be pro-abortion and pro-LGBTQ and, and against religious liberties. When we're fighting these existential type of things, yeah, we need someone who's a real fighter. It's a shame that the guy who's a real fighter also you know, kicks people and, and spits on them. But right now we need a fighter. I use the analogy of having a next door neighbor who's an MMA fighter. Uh, you don't like him, you know, he drinks a lot, he has his girlfriends over, he's a bad example for your kids. But when someone comes uh, to try to kill your family, you're so glad you have this neighbor because he chases them <laughs> off and says, don't ever come back. That's really what we're looking at today. The stakes are that high. Wow, you know, well it, said, I appreciate that you guys, I think that's gonna be helpful for a lot of people Jason, when, they, I, when they hear I, that. Scott? Jason, can I add one thing here? Sure. Uh, I, I'm often puzzled by evangelicals 
who are quick to point out that Dr Donald Trump's character is an obstacle to evangelism, but Joe Biden's character isn't one. Uh, let's think about this for a moment. Joe Biden is a candidate that says you can intentionally kill innocent human beings in the womb, and he's also not willing to restrict grisly late-term abortions. Why isn't that a character flaw? And then we also need to go back, let's dial back to 1987. The mainstream media torpedoed Joe Biden's presidential campaign by exposing him as a blatant plagiarist and a guy who not only was plagiarizing the, the writing of others and doing uh, all kinds of things, but embellishing his own record, claiming he graduated first in his class academically, when in fact he was almost dead last. Now, why aren't those things uh, obstacles to evangelism? And instead, we only point at Donald Trump's past as an obstacle to evangelism. Again, I, I come back to what uh, Grudem said. With Trump, we're going to get good policies and a flawed character. With Biden, we're going to get flawed character and flawed policies. Hmm. Well, and I, and I think what you guys just said, it boils down to that we, we as Christians are called to uphold biblical principles that, that advance good policy for families across the board. And we know it's going to be done through fallen people. I mean, when we, all, when we want originalists, you know, obviously in, in SCOTUS, of course, for any federal judge or judge for that matter, to uphold the law uh, and, and have a moral conscience to know that there is, a, you know, a, a divine being, you know, a supreme moral lawgiver that that resides above them that they're not the ultimate standard but god is um we we know that there it's going to benefit society and our founders putting the checks and balances believed in original sin they believed that man has fallen and that we're not to have absolute power that's why this nation was not built as a monarch but was built for a more perfect union uh you know uh, a republic that we wanted to advance these ideals that we're talking about and I think the other thing, based on everything that you guys were saying, too, for, to remind our listeners and viewers is also that when you elect a president, you're essentially electing over 50,000 different people that represent the White House that come from that branch of government. And I don't think people really realize that. And when we've already seen the first four years with the president, we have more Jewish, Catholic and Christian people that are leading the White House every single day of their lives, advancing religious freedom. And it's remarkable. And so you're not just electing a man, you're electing an entire administration. You think of the cabinet alone. I mean, Michael, what are some of the key players that we have seen the last four years in the cabinet that have helped our president advance, again, religious freedom? Well, when, when you have uh, people like former Governor Perry when you have people like Ben Carson on the cabinet, just to mention a couple, when you have other people close to him, like Mike Pence and Mike Pompeo, who are strong in their Christian faith. And then when you have evangelical leaders like James Robison and many others and Samuel Rodriguez and, and Harry Jackson, so that's white, Hispanic, black, that have the president's ear, that's very significant. I know, for example, that when Reagan was elected, and he was elected with the help of people like Bill Bright and James Dobson and James Robison, that once he was in office, Washington was able to put a wall around him, and, and these people didn't have the same access to him. I remember the disappointment when evangelicals helped George W. Bush get elected, and it's not that he was a bad man, but there was a sense that he would do more for evangelical causes than really happened. It's, it's really been the opposite with Trump in, in a way that is unprecedented and welcoming prayer and opening his doors. That's why a recent poll, and it's an outlying poll, but it said that Trump now had support of 31% of black Americans. If that's true, it's because he's reached out. It's, and it's because he said, this is an issue to me. I was not aware uh, until a few years ago, but Jared Kushner's father was arrested and imprisoned years ago. And as Jared Kushner would visit his father and see the prison system, he saw the inequities and the inequalities. And that's why he was a driving force for prison reform that have helped a lot of black Americans. It's an interesting dynamic that we wouldn't think about, but it's one that's come to pass. And then you look at the trickle down effect, uh, not just the three Supreme Court justices, which is massive, 
but 200 national judges, federal judges, life appointees. Uh, last year, or it could have been early this year, New York said that they were banning so-called conversion therapy for people of all ages. So if you're a, a 40-year-old male struggling with same-sex attraction, married to a woman and wanting help, it would be illegal for you to get professional counsel to help you deal with unwanted same-sex attraction. In fact, it'd be a $10,000 fine for the counselor who would meet with you. An Orthodox Jewish counselor took New York to court with the help of the Alliance Defending Freedom, and on the spot, New York dropped the ban and said, okay, we'll retreat. What happened? Well, they knew that the case was going to be, however the verdict was, if they lost, the case would be appealed to the court above them, which had two new Trump appointees, and they knew they would lose, so they abandoned the law. That is something that works out in our everyday lives in profound ways. You wouldn't think of it. You wouldn't see it. But that's part of the trickle-down effect of the Trump presidency. Mm. Well, let's turn to the third topic as we're trying to answer the question, should Christians vote in the election in 2020? Now, obviously, Scott, I'm going to refer this to you right off the bat. So when a lot of times when, when a Christian just says, you know, I am a single issue voter, it's all about abortion. I don't believe in abortion. It's morally reprehensible. It's morally wrong. So I'm going to vote for Trump. And then you got somebody else, as Michael was debating somebody recently, a liberal professor, I guess, who was professing to be a Christian was saying that that's not good enough reason just to vote for Trump. Therefore, he's voting for Biden because he thinks he's going to instill different policies. So when you do see the one issue voter, how would you respond, again, from the, the positive side, but also the negative? Well, look, of course, abortion isn't the only issue any more than defeating the Nazis was the only issue in 1940 or freeing the slaves the only issue in 1860. But both were the dominant moral issues of their day. And Christians are correct to give greater weight to the more dominant issues than they do lesser ones. That is not uh, an act of compromise. That's sound moral thinking. And I think in a lot of Christians' minds, the reason why they call out the pro-life issue as being single issue is they throw a bunch of evils into one moral stew and mix it all up and say, well, they're all morally equivalent. Well, they're not. And this is where I think we need to make another careful distinction. Our Catholic moral theologian friends distinguish between intrinsic evils and contingent evils. Mm -hmm. Intrinsic evils must always be opposed. They're evil on the face of it. Things like rape, murder, torturing toddlers for fun would be examples of intrinsic evils we should always oppose. But then in another category are things we call contingent evils. Contingent evils may be wrong, but it depends on the context. For example, a war. A war can be just or unjust, and the circumstances will determine it. It's not an intrinsic evil. In fact, there could be cases where it would be evil not to go to war, but it's a contingent one. And what people do is they're willing to give a pass to leftist political candidates who promise to help us limit contingent evils while they wholeheartedly endorse intrinsic ones. And that's where you get this notion that, oh, we shouldn't be a single issue voter. Well, imagine that a head of state had a great health care policy, he had a great economic plan, but he felt it should be legal for you to beat your wife, and he was going to make sure that that alleged right to beat your wife was enshrined in every layer of law. Wouldn't that be reason enough to reject him? It doesn't matter that he was good on those other issues. He is disqualified because he is endorsing and promoting an intrinsic evil. That's what I think uh, the mistake is that people make when they say, oh, you're just a single issue voter. They're treating all these issues as if they're morally equivalent and they're not. Mm. Well said. I think that's important that they're not equivalent. So Michael, what are some, again, if as a, as pro-lifers, we believe that the unborn baby, the preborn is indeed a human life in the womb. And we all know that we are made in the image of God, that we have intrinsic value, dignity, and worth. We're part of the, the human family, right, from the moment of conception, based on the science of embryology. And Scott does a, just a tremendous, tremendous job, not just with our summit students every summer, but in all of his materials, making the case for life in his great book, 
and in the in the in the Life Training Institute. But what are other issues then? We support, we are a voice, as Proverbs thirty one tells us to be, for people that are in need of help. And who needs more help than the unborn right these days? But what are some other key issues? They may not be on par, like Scott said, when it comes to the unborn, because we're dealing with direct life that we don't have a right morally to take, right? Because we say it's the right of privacy. What are some other key uh, issues that we as Christians are voting on and not just pro-life issues, but what are some other key ones? Obviously, freedom is, is the foundation on which our nation is founded, freedom of religion, speech, and conscience. There's an all-out assault on our freedoms these days, and we, we are going, in my view, the way of either a Trump presidency or the cancel culture, a Trump presidency or mobocracy, a Trump presidency or an antichrist socialism. So religious freedom and the larger freedom of uh, speech and conscience those are really at stake right now, and, and that's massive. A fundamental definition of, of family. You have Justices Alito and Thomas who have challenged the outrageous 2015 Obergefell ruling that redefined marriage and said that should never have been decided by the Supreme Court. That affects our culture in a massive way. While we reach out to every individual, whether they identify as gay or straight or trans or whatever, we reach out to everyone with the love of God and say that Jesus died for each one. At the same time, we recognize that there is a destructive LGBTQ agenda. And again, on each of these things, we see where the parties fall. Just read the platforms, look at the platforms, see what's out there. The whole direction of critical race theory and where that goes and how that will ultimately be a direct assault on our freedoms. I, I was warning and saying, listen, uh, watch what they're going to be burning next at, at, at these protests and riots. So uh, they're, they go from burning flags to burning Bibles. And then I said, it's not going to be what, it's going to be who. A few days later, they're trying to burn police officers alive inside of a, of a police precinct. So this is, this is what we're dealing with. I was speaking with a Chinese man in Australia earlier this year. And he was now an Australian citizen, but he was very concerned about the direction of his country under, under President Xi. And uh, I asked him, what do you think of Trump? He said, he's a hero. Because from his viewpoint, there's in Hong Kong, from his viewpoint, Trump is challenging the tyranny of religious minorities and others in other parts of the world, and Trump pushing back on their behalf. And then as much as we can be selfish in voting for economy, a healthy economy does benefit the poor and does help the downtrodden. So I look at all of these things which are going to affect America on a large level. And yes, abortion is definitely at the top of the list. But these other issues are important to me. Our relationship to Israel and the health of the Middle East is also very important. And in each case, it's black and white to me. Now, we'll address in a moment the question of Christians sitting out the election. But what I cannot possibly see is a Christian, especially someone who claims to be a pro-life Christian, cast a vote for the Democratic Party when they know what that party stands for, when they know that Kamala Harris, who could well replace Joe Biden, is, is, is the most pro-abortion candidate we've had in our nation's history, when we know that rather than prosecuting Planned Parenthood for the selling of, of baby parts, instead prosecutes David Daleiden for exposing them and, and, and authorizes a raid on his house to confiscate the videos. I mean, this is outrageous. And, and this is well where things could go. So we, we have to look at these larger issues. And I interacted with pro-life evangelicals for Biden, and I found their arguments to be unbelievably weak. I, I mean, in the midst of it, they said, smoking kills. Smoking kills. What in the world does that have to do with is, is Trump leading the nation and saying we all need to smoke more? And, and, you, and you're going to compare smoking deaths where someone willfully does that to the slaughter of the unborn? Racism kills. Yeah. But how many people are killed outright by racism every year, which we all say is wrong, compared to the legal slaughter of the unborn right up to the, to the point of birth in different states in, in America? And they say, well, well, climate change. Look, there's debate about climate change and global warming, but no one is willfully saying we are going to work together to destroy the planet, to wipe out the human race, but people are saying we're going to work together to destroy the unborn in the womb. 
Well, and, and, and I agree with what you guys are saying. And the other thing is, I mean, we don't even have time to get, get into it. But again, if you have Trump, you have a limited government, which anytime you have big government, you have less religious freedoms. We have a roaring economy, as we know, in the third quarter, 33.1%. These are big issues. This helps families. It helps continue to do what America does so great in advancing religious freedoms, in funding organizations, ministries that we run to educate the next generation um, and not only not only that, but, you know, Dr. Brown, you do so well on your show repeatedly talking about uh, pro-Israel policies that we have. I just was reading The Guardian recently. The Palestinian prime minister, when asked what his thoughts are, if Trump was reelected, and he says, quote, if we are going to live another four years with President Trump, God help us. God help you and God help the whole world. He says a second Trump term would be disastrous. And you think that that is a direct enemy of Israel. We are to support and pray for the revival of Israel. And so we know that we have a president in office right now who supports Israel. Uh, and there's been so many things that he has done. And uh, that is a huge, obviously, deciding factor for Christians to not sit this one out. So before we end this interview, I do want to uh, touch, touch base real quickly. What would be your last case if you had uh, just a few minutes with somebody who is undecided? They're Christian, they're pro-life, they're disturbed by what they're seeing in the riots today out there on the streets. They're very scared of Kamala. They're thinking maybe Biden something, maybe early signs of dementia or whatever. And he had eight years and he was a senator. And, you know, you keep hearing the 47 years versus the 47 months of Trump. And he hasn't really done anything in this whole China stuff and taking money. And has he been bought? And they're worried, but they're thinking, but I, you know, still these issues I don't like about Trump. He's so bombastic and loud and infidelity in the past and all that kind of stuff. I'm just not sure I can go vote on Tuesday. Scott, starting with you, and then we'll close with Michael. You have a few minutes. What case would you make if you just boil everything down that we've talked about today? What would you say to that that man or that woman who is undecided but Christian? Well, I would take them right to our biblical responsibilities that we mentioned earlier. As Christians, we have a duty to limit evil and promote the good insofar as possible. We live in an imperfect world. Michael made a great point about that. In this life, you're never going to have the ideal candidate. The choice before us is a candidate with flawed character who will promote and advance and legislate flawed policies that will be very destructive to this nation. Or, on the other hand, a character who has flawed things about him but who will advance good in the culture. That's the choice in front of us. And as Christians, our duty is to limit evil and promote the good. And you don't get that by sitting it out. Secondly, I would point out again that God holds sovereigns responsible in Scripture. And I've done quite a bit of study on this, and the texts just keep on coming. And to say then that we are, as a constitutional republic, we the people are the sovereign means God holds us responsible to promote good and limit evil. And by sitting out this election, uh, you're not doing a moral good, you're failing your biblical mandate. Mm. Uh, Michael, last word, what would you say again to an undecided who is Christian? Yeah, I would say, listen, I, I respect your struggle. And, and I can't play God for you, and you have to give account to God. But will sitting out the election make sense if you talk to your kids and grandkids about it in the years to come? What, what, if, what if Joe Biden, Kamala Harris are elected? What if the Senate flips? What if the progress we've made in the courts is, is now stopped? What if our liberties are really threatened? What if Roe v. Wade becomes fully enshrined? What if we're no longer able to push back effectively against international terror? What if the worst case scenarios come to pass? Are you going to be able to explain that to your kids and grandkids and say, you're in the mess that you're in now. The schools are in the mess that they're in. The churches are in the mess that they're in. Because I, I, I couldn't vote for this guy because he was so nasty, mean-spirited, divisive, and narcissistic. Will that make sense? Will, will that play out? I go back to Scott's analogy with the slave. Would, would that play out when you're explaining it to that person? What you're basically saying is, I'm leaving 
the direction and immediate future of the nation, I'm leaving that in the hands of others entirely. And, and, and I myself, even though I have the ability to make a difference, won't. And then I'd say this last thing. It's easier to differ with a personality than to fight against policies. So vote. You don't have to tell anyone how you voted. You can just say, that's my personal choice. And if President Trump does things you don't like, you just say, I don't like that. I don't agree with it. Vote to get him in for the sake of the policies and the direction of the nation, and then work against his character qualities when you see them as divisive and when you see evangelical identification with the president as being destructive. On the flip side, if you don't vote at all, it's going to be virtually impossible to fight against the policies, which will then affect you, your children, and your grandchildren. Well, well, uh, well said, you guys. And I, I, d- I deeply appreciate the time that we spent, the three of us, to help, again, really undecided you know, uh, voters who are Christian that are struggling in the midst of this. I know there are many people that we love, we respect, we're praying for them. And as we wrap up, I want to remind all of our viewers and listeners, Proverbs 3, verse 27 says, do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to do it. And going to vote, going to the ballot box, what a great freedom that we have from the men and women who have made this country, you know, what it is today that we get to experience the treasure, the, the, the cherished freedoms that we have. And I know uh, you guys are with me when I say to all of our uh, American uh, colleagues out there and families and people of, of the same faith and of different faith to go out and vote and not let some of the concerns you have with, you know, prevent you from going out there and making your voice heard. If we know what is the right thing to do, it is our responsibility to do it. So Scott, thank you for joining us today. I appreciate you, my friend. And Michael, as always, great to be with you guys both. I think this has been a very constructive conversation. Hopefully, it has persuaded people, and you guys both did it with class as always. And I respect you guys immensely and appreciate your due diligence and your responsibility to speak the truth and love and to, to show people this is a biblical worldview on display, being able to articulate these issues without being nasty and mean. And so hopefully people will really be encouraged when they watch this. So thank you guys for joining me today. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. So there you have it, you guys. I mean, I think that they're the one, one of the most effective ways to ensure that we can continue to advance religious freedom. We can continue to advance biblical marriage. The right to life and limited government is by voting. And you vote for officials who acknowledge God and who will not infringe on our God-given rights. It is evident in scripture that religious freedom is a gift of God and therefore considered a fundamental human right. But if Christians take for granted their religious freedoms, at some point, those freedoms will no longer exist. And once our liberties are lost, my friends, it is next to impossible to recover them. So please go out there and vote. And hopefully what Scott and Michael have shared with you today has convinced you and share it with people who are not convinced either and they're struggling because there's one thing that we are seeing right now is confusion. And that's where Satan wants us to be. So be blessed, my friends. Continue to pray for our elected officials and continue to pray that Together, we will unite uh, under the banner of the Lord and advance religious freedom. God bless you guys. Thanks for watching. 